this is a, a probably an unusual paper for this seminar in that um, it's a really written for a, a law econ journal and it doesn't have um, a new theoretical model. Um, so I think maybe for those uh, watching today, you should think of this a little more as um, kind of or organizing theoretical ideas, but also perhaps um, inspiring future uh, modeling. And I'm one of the things I'm actually very interested in from you all is um, input on, you know, where you think uh, new formal models are really necessary. So I'd, I'd sort of invite you to join us in, in this journey and saying, you know, this taking this critical look of, well, wh what, if, what if what I say today is obvious? Um, what do you possibly disagree with or what do you think really needs a model to clarify when it's true and when it's false? Um, and so I think with platform economics, actually very little is completely obvious. So it's probably a little bit, um, you know, you I, I almost certainly somewhere along the way, you're going to, you're going to say, gosh, you know, that's a little strong statement that must be qualified. There must be conditions under which that's not, not exactly right. So, um, that, that's what we'd really invite you to do. So apologies for the non-standard talk. Um, Fiona was the one who agreed to it. So I'm going to blame her for accepting uh, this invitation um, to speak to, to this audience here, but I'm not trying to insult your intelligence by not showing you not a model. I should say, I'm, I would say I'm too old to write theorems anymore, but I'm actually writing theorems about things like regret bounds for contextual bandits and things like that. So I'm writing different kinds of theorems these days. Um, and maybe you, you can rope me back into writing more IO theory uh, theorems as well. Um, okay. So uh, here we go. Um, and I also just want to give a couple of quick disclosures because th this, I'm, this is going to have some uh, policy implications and I'm also going to use some specific examples. I apologize, but I'm going to use both. The examples I'm going to use are both about Google. Um, many of you know I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about Google and lobbying about Google, um, but it happens that these are the examples that are, have lawsuits associated with them. Um, and so those are just the best examples that are, are that have a lot of public information from the lawsuits that have been filed. Um, I, I was, as many of you know, consulting chief economist for Microsoft. I stopped doing that seven years ago. There have been two chief economists since then, um, but this still builds on you know things that I did there. And and so um, that's, uh, but I'm. This is definitely they have nothing to do with this because I don't have a close relationship with them anymore. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about platform annexation. And just as an introduction, um, the like old view on, on integration generally um, can be kind of boiled down to some simple um, maxims. Uh, horizontal bad, um, horizontal integration reduces competition. You weigh the benefits, the, um, the cost against the potential benefits like scale economies and the cost benefit um, would go in favor of a uh, merger of weaker rivals. Um, so, you know, the, 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 in general, if we have scale economies, you might want two weaker rivals um, to, to merge, um, but that's, you know, a kind of a special case. Although in platforms, as we know, that's a relatively common issue that, you know, you might want number two and number three, um, to merge in some things, uh, if if they're if they're going to go out of business or if they don't have enough scale economies, because um, uh, you'd rather have you know two than one. Um, but uh, vertical, on the other hand, ha was typically good, um, and we thought of it as you know solving double marginalization problems. And for the context of this talk, I want to reframe the du double marginalization, which we all kind of talk about the buzzword, but really the, another way to put that same idea is that it resolves a conflict of interest between a supplier and a retailer or manufacturer. Um, and so, you know, they have a conflict of interest. They're trying to go after an overall margin between um, price and cost. And by, um, you know, by, by merging, they're going to, they're going to, um, internalize that, but if they're separate, then they end up with too high a margin, basically is in a, each of them attempt to get more of the margin. So they, they each mark up a little bit more 
um, than, than they would. And so that conflict of interest is going to be what we're going to focus on in the platform annexation, um, that, that theme. Um, of course, it also all sorts of other things, which, which this audience is deeply familiar with, but um, you know, it can align incentives for investments. Um, and there's a, you know, a similar theory for, for tying and bundling. Um, there, the idea is, you know, well, there is a single monopoly profit to be had um, in a polar case where two goods are consumed in fixed proportion. If there is market power for one of the goods, then charging more for for um, for one reduces the price that can be charged from the other. There's only one monopoly profit to be gone after. Therefore, bundling is fine. So there's no harm to tying. Um, for the single monopoly profit idea for for bundling, there's of course many exceptions. Um, like you know the the goods aren't aren't consumed in fixed proportion. I always think about the single monopoly profit theory for tying as being like left, left shoes and right shoes. Um, but if, if they're not consumed in fixed proportion, then there's, there's, then the amount of the profit can vary depending on market structure. Um, you know, consumers of tied products might also consume complementary products from other firms. Um, that's enough that, that creates an externality. Um, and especially market power or entry might be affected by tying. Um, so those are some of the some of the forces that lead to more complex um, setups. And there's a nice um, summary by Joe Farrell and Phil Weiser from 2003, the Law Econ paper that surveys a lot of this literature. If you haven't read that, that's kind of a nice a nice paper, and it's kind of interesting now that Phil Weiser um, was Attorney General um, of Colorado and is actually uh, involved in some of these. Uh, related antitrust cases since he, it's unusual that the attorney general actually wrote some of the foundational articles. Um, so, um, okay. So the modern antitrust uh, view on vertical integration is that, you know, there, there are many reasons that it can be bad. Um, and, you know, the, the, one of them raising rivals costs. We have Steve Salop here. Um, so he pioneered that line of research and is still writing papers uh, today that, that uh, relate to this, this, this issue. Um, as recently as last year, there's a, he has a nice um, paper summarizing some of these issues. So the raising rivals cost, um, if a supplier upstream and a manufacturer downstream merge, the supplier might charge a higher price to the competing manufacturer. And in this model, um, upstream firms indirectly support competition between downstream firms. And so that's a, a, gonna be another theme that we're gonna pick up in, in, in this paper, um, the, the role of vertical integration of certain types um, for supporting competition. And that'll be a, a, big, a big theme, but we're gonna kind of specialize that. Um, and when there are scale economies or entry barriers, foreclosing arrival can have any competitive effects. Um, more recently, and I think sort of in the same similar spirit as the paper we're writing, we, people, because something called vertical manipulation has become a big thing from a practical perspective, people have specialized in on the problem of vertical manipulation and written targeted models uh, you know, for that problem. The theory is similar to raising rivals' costs. Here, vertical manipulation might be depriving a vertically related firm of their user base. And so this would be something like Amazon or, or Google doing vertical manipulation in search results. Um, now, there's similar to these other cases, there's gonna be examples where this is good or where it's bad. Um, vertical manipulation might not hurt welfare if the downstream firm is competitive or there are low entry barriers. So, you know, we can be, we can think about customer protection for Amazon sellers, but if the battery market is competitive, then if Amazon, you know, preferences its batteries, then, you know, that's not necessarily gonna be bad for consumers as long as you know, there's free entry in batteries and Amazon isn't gonna tie up the world battery market. But if there are scale economies or important innovation um, considerations, then this can be bad. Um, another area 
where um, vertical manipulation can be uh, problematic is if the downstream firm is a nascent competitive threat. It might be a complement today that grows into a substitute tomorrow. And so we might also worry about, you know, Google um, manipulating against, you know, shopping like Amazon um, because they're worried that Amazon is a nascent competitive threat to Google and search. Um, so th there's also going to be an element of that in our in our paper as well, where we're going to be talking about um, the role, you know, vertical vertical integration um, affecting something that really turns out to affect overall competition in the market. So those are those are some of the modern views, but you know, as you can see, there's a, there's sort of a lot of moving parts in these models, and so we want to spend some time to specialize in on on um, a, a part that hasn't received as much special attention. So platforms and marketplaces, everybody here knows this. We're going to talk about um, platforms and intermediaries with indirect network effects and multi multi homing. Um, we're going to focus a lot on multi-homing as an important force in platform competition. And we'll use the term take rate uh, to loosely to uh, be associated with the fee charged by the platform. And one of the, the key ideas is that um, when platforms aren't differentiated and both sides multi-home, platform competition um, can, under many circumstances, lead to low take rates. So, you know, the platform's tax on this is, is low. So just as an example of the role of multi-homing, so um, I think Uber and Lyft are, is, is one of the examples that we're all familiar with, where there's pretty active multi-homing on both sides of the market. Um, you know, there's, there's a market with indirect network effects, but in, in markets where there is, there are two platforms of, of relatively similar strength, um, a rider will typically actively multi-home for each transaction, um, while the, the drivers also actively multi-home. Um, now, this is, this is a situation where there are benefits to multi-homing on both sides that motivate people to do it. You know, if you find out Uber is going to take 10 minutes, then you're going to look and see about the lift. And as we're getting back into the market now, you're seeing this where there's really long delays for Uber is where I live now still. So it's especially beneficial to check both apps to see if there happens to be a car um, that's closer on the other app. While the drivers are also very motivated to multi-home because um, if they're they they if they're sitting there, they're, they're looking for, for more riders. And so that leads to intense platform competition, which can lower take rates and reduce intermediary profits. Now, some people um, are concerned about other issues with Uber and Lyft around labor issues or whatever, but from a just platform perspective, putting aside um, you know, labor issues, this is generally beneficial. Of course, if you're Uber and Lyft, you're gonna be thinking about ways out of this um, and try to get some loyalty. Uh, but, and so we, we, as we see this evolve, don't come back later and say, oh, gee, Susan, you said this was gonna be competitive and it's not, um, we, they may find ways out of the, out of the multi-homing um, situation, but it's one that in principle um, leads them to need to differentiate in terms of improving their platform and it, and it keeps, um, keeps take rates low. So then if, you know, given that multi-homing um, can, you know, and I should say, um, you know, what are the mechanisms for how this works that in the end, you know, the, they, they need to, uh, you know, if, if most of the riders are on both apps and if most of the drivers open both apps, then clearly people can you know, search for a better deal on the other platform. So in terms of interfering with multi-homing, what are some of the things that get in the way? Um, well, there can be natural reasons and those can lead to kind of comp can lead to competition problems, but there are sort of exogenous reasons that you have competition problems. Um, things like a long purchase cycle, like if you're buying hardware, like a, a console or a device that's that's purchased a, alongside a, a software platform, then you're going to be with that for a long time and the consumers will be effectively single homing. Um, 
But you can also have natural reasons related to time or location sensitive supply and, or demand, um, things like a search engine. You're doing a search right now. You're about to go to a website right now. So you're effectively single homing, even if over time you use different search engines or also, also like mobile activities. Um, if you're out and you're looking for a coffee shop, your, your need will evaporate. And so you're effectively single homing for that um, at that moment. Um, but what we wanna focus on are platform actions that reduce multi-homing. And so there are many of these as well, but we're gonna focus in on one. Um, some of the others include limiting access to users through long-term exclusive contracts or technical provisions, um, loyalty programs, and that's something that you might see Uber and Lyft um, leaning into more, other types of artificial switching costs um, or, or um, either contractual or, or technical um, can be examples. But what we're going to focus on are when the case where the platform expands into adjacent areas or tools that create frictions for participant multi-homing. Multi so how does this work? So um, we'll, we'll think about a situation where there are platforms and intermediaries, and there's um, in the initial condition, <clears throat> there's at least uh, two platforms. And, and so there's a possibility of multi-homing. And in situations like that, um, there's often demand side tools or supply side tools that help people plug in. And these tools can come into being also, even if there's one, but they're gonna be especially important for our analysis if there's two or there's, or there's at least potentially two platforms. Um, and so what is the role of these, these tools? These tools are gonna basically help the supply or demand side compare prices and offers across platforms. And they may also actually just technically help them plug into multiple platforms through APIs so that from the perspective of a market participant, they're interacting with the tool and that in turn um, lets them fairly seamlessly interact with multiple platforms. And so, you know, what, what, what's the benefit of these potential tools? They can increase multi-homing, um, intensify competition, um, you know, reduce search costs, things like make sure that people can find up prices. Um, and they can also um, enhance buyer supplier power in a variety of ways. They aggregate consumers and they thus have bargaining power with the platforms. For example, they can, in, not just in terms of, of price, which is a less common role that they're actually really negotiating price, but more commonly, they can incentivize platforms to provide information, data, et cetera. So if a tool is trying to help the, the participants choose platforms, they're gonna need certain data in order to compare prices and they can say, hey, if you don't provide this data, we're providing it for you know, your com the competing platform. And so the, the, the platform may actually miss out on, um, on business if it doesn't, um, you know, provide this information uh, to the tools. So they, they, can, they can do a lot to kind of re restore a balance of power between um, concentrated platforms and less concentrated suppliers and, and, um, and, on, and market participants. And they, they also are, are going to um, therefore affect the way competition works. Um, Multi-homing on at least one side of the market um, can, for example, reduce platform entry barriers. So if a platform somehow or another can attract one side of the market through differentiation or quality or pricing, if there's a tool on the other side of the market, then it can, they can help solve this chicken and egg problem. You know, if, you've, if, you, come, if you can somehow get one side on, um, on board, even a niche on one side, then the tools make it very easy for the other side to uh, multi-home. So it's, it's essentially like, you know, aggregating one side of the market and then they getting them all to multi-home by just by getting the tool to turn on a switch in the, in the ideal world. So they can really substantially reduce uh, barriers to entry. And that also makes them particularly important in markets where entry is, is hard. Um, and you know, sufficient multi-homing on both sides can lead to low take rates, enhanced competition, and efficiency. And they can lead to an, sort of an ideal scenario where network effects occur at the market level rather than at the platform level. 
And so, again, I think it's 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 easy for a regulator to to look and say to ask a question. Well, gee, if these indirect network effects are so large, why shouldn't there just be a single platform? But the point is that if if people are able to plug into to multiple platforms then the network effects are at the market level and not the platform level. And so then there's little benefit of having a single platform. Um, of course, there's saving on the fixed costs, but um, they're, they're, you know, we, we always are willing to incur some extra fixed costs in order to get some competition and incentives for innovation. And so partly now I'll, 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 I'll preview, but, you know, for where we could use modeling, um, you know, this is actually a, even though it seems like a fairly simple story, there, there are, would be a lot of moving parts in a full theoretical model. So we need to have two sides of the market. Um, we wanna think about an incumbent platform and a competing platform and potential entrance. We, we're gonna need to model the multi-homing costs that direct connections are costly. We're gonna have tools, which are a separate product that facilitate connection or price comparison. So you have to kind of build in what those benefits are um, reducing multi-homing costs. And therefore, we also have to have endogenous multi-homing um, as, as part of this then. Um, the tools need to have some scale economies and or switching costs. Um, and finally, the platforms are gonna have a larger dimensional choice set because platforms are going to be able to choose whether to and how to interoperate with tools. So one of the strategic variables on the part of a platform might be whether or not to allow a tool to access their API. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of choices here, which is part of the reason we didn't, we haven't yet written out like a full, a full model of all of this. So now let me dive into some specific examples. And um, these are examples that I've worked on from an antitrust perspective that have been the subject of, of antitrust investigations, in some cases in resolved investigations, but also things that I worked on from the business perspective where um, it was very clear that the tools played a really important role. So um, one of these was, I mean, of course, there's so many investigations now, but this was the, uh, the original FTC investigation into search um, in the early 2000s, um, you know, brought out a lot of these facts. So in the, in the search market, um, we, all of you are familiar with just using a search engine, but there's also a third party market for syndication and distribution. And the recent DOJ um, lawsuit is about the distribution side of that market, um, but there's also a syndication side of that market too. And so we think about the ad platforms at that time, Yahoo ads, Bing ads, and Google AdWords, they were branded at the time, um, are ad platforms that bring together advertisers and third-party publishers um, for, uh, for providing search services. And so I, I put a little uh, list on there derived from Comscore data in 2009, which showed sort of the size of that market. That was about a third uh, to about a third to about 40 percent of the search advertising business um, was part of, of of this syndication market. So instead of it being that, that you did a search on Google.com, you did a search or something that was like a search on a third party property, and those properties in turn. Um, used uh, advertising from these ad search advertising platforms. So the search platforms both provided ads on first party like google.com and yahoo.com, but they also provided ads on third party sites. Um, and so the reason that's important is that, you know, th that's where um, the, the market was, part of this market was, was matching advertisers and publishers. And this is the case where um, while end users going to google.com may not care directly about advertising revenue. These third parties um, were mainly motivated by advertising revenue. So the more advertisers you had, the more publishers you would get. Um, and that was reflected in, in the market shares at the time. Um, Google had about 10 times the, the market share of the other competitors in syndication, for example, and in syndication and distribution. So, um, and in Europe, it's always been that way or more. Um, 
So what were some of, what were these tools? Well, from the perspective of an advertiser, um, you know, what they wanted to do was to serve an ad for someone who was searching for something. So they might be searching for car insurance. Um, from an advertiser's perspective, uh, these things were very similar across the different search advertising uh, platforms. They were all doing basically the same thing, um, matching ads to keywords. And from the, so from the advertiser's perspective, the natural thing to do would be to manage all of their search advertising and manage it across platforms. And so early on, there were a lot of software products that did that. And so an advertiser cared much more whether you had searched for you know, auto insurance versus car insurance than whether you had placed that search on yahoo.com or google.com. So the, the keywords were more of the unit of analysis rather than you know, which platform you were on. So it was very natural for, for advertisers to completely multi-home across different search platforms and use these tools. But um, there were, the, in this case, um, Google put on a bunch of API restrictions for tools that also accessed Google's AdWords. And the APIs were needed for this software to plug in and, and manage your, your search advertising at scale. So here, the benefit of the tools, what the tools did was they really helped an advertiser plug into multiple search advertising platforms at the same time, help them manage their bids and manage their, their ROI. So there were a bunch of restrictions that were put on. They, they prohibit, they were, they were, um, the restrictions said that tools that collected and used advertisers own data for use on other platforms or for comparison with data on other platforms were not allowed to be provided by tools. So a tool that in principle should be doing price comparison was actually not allowed to do price comparison to Google or else they couldn't plug into um, Google's platform. Um, they prohibited advertisers from directly transferring or copying their own data from AdWords into another platform um, by any automated means. And they allowed Google to shut off API service for any breach. So that made it really hard for a tool to actually provide any value because the main value a tool would have would be to help you compare prices and go across different platforms. So a lot of these tools exited um, and or they had their API access shut off if they violated Google's terms and conditions. And so then um, Google had its own tool, which then it developed and got a lot of advertisers onto there. Later on, some of those terms and conditions were dropped in response to an investigation, but at that point, a lot of advertisers were on, um, on using Google's tools. And then over time, those tools would not plug in um, equally to other platforms. So this is an example where in the presence of the tool, an independent tool that could plug into multiple platforms, a lot of the multi-homing problem by advertisers could have or should have been solved. And it was definitely what the advertisers wanted. Um, they wanted to multi-home um, and they wanted to, to do this comparison. There's just like no, no, no real um, doubt about that from, from the, from the uh, evidence record and, and from, from advertisers' perspective. And if that multi-homing had been more complete, then the syndication and distribution markets also would have been more competitive, um, which in turn could have helped sponsor entry or allowed um, uh, competing platforms to grow. Um, and I, there's, a th there's a third part of this, which is the, the user search engines, google.com and bing.com or um, other, other search engines, which would have benefited from that as well. Okay, so that's one big example of this. And, and it's kind of surprising actually that there haven't been more papers about this, I think, because all of this you know, came out in fairly gory detail you know, 10 years ago. Um, and, and this was a fairly big deal. But I think at the time, people, I probably, I tried to get economists to work on it at the time, but I think it was sort of viewed as sort of a niche topic and, and something that was so specialized that like people ne necessarily care about it as a general interest matter. And I think now just people's interests have changed. So I still think it's, there's, there's um, you know, room for looking at this. The second one is more complicated. Um, I, I, I was also interested, this has been something that's been going on for the last 13 or 14 years. Many of you at some point in time heard me try to pitch you to work on this, um, but it was always hard to work on because there weren't a lot of facts out there. But the, if you read some of the recent um, lawsuits that have been filed, for example, um, by the state of Texas, 
Um, they've, they've actually laid out a lot of facts now that make it a little bit easier to wrap your head around um, what's, what's going on. Um, so this is a case of, of advertising exchanges. It's a, it's a similar setup, and I did this on purpose. I focused here on, on the third-party advertising market in search to help lead into um, advertising exchanges. So advertising exchanges are going to map not just for kind of search-like advertising, but for display or video advertising, um, publishers and advertisers. And in this case, um, you know, self-service isn't really so much of an option. Everybody needs tools to plug into these exchanges. Um, while in search, there was some kind of self-service where you didn't necessarily have to use tools. Um, and so these ad exchanges um, are, are then interoperate with, uh, with tools that help both publishers and advertisers um, um, interact. And so independent tools compete for constituents in terms of quantity, service, or price. Um, and they, again, are going to enable entry by facilitating multi-homing to smaller platforms, and they'll support competition. Um, so well, annex tools, in principle, can steer business to their own platform. And this annexation can be implemented either through ownership or through contracts. Um, in, in this case, that I'm, the example I'm showing here, it's, it's through ownership. Um, and they sometimes can attract customers by providing an advantage over other tools and interoperating with their own platform. So in the case of publishers, the publishers would be like newspapers, um, would be a, a key example of publishers. Um, and they use something called a publisher ad server which helps them interact with an ad exchange. And the ad exchange is holding an auction. Um, on the other side, advertisers are plugging in and they're plugging in through something called the demand side platform. And so if you read the antitrust complaint by Texas, it details a lot of the different um, behavior, particularly on the publisher side of the market. But basically um, Google acquired DoubleClick, which was an independent tools provider that helped publishers interoperate with, with ad exchanges. Um, after Google took over their, the publisher ad server from DoubleClick, it started advantaging Google um, in auctions. For example, letting, letting Google's ad exchange look at the bids of the other players before placing its own bid. Um, and it also gave it um, differential access to information. And so what that does, I've kind of delineated that here in this picture, if you had a rival ad exchange, um, there's a kind of an orange arrow here with an X next to Google publisher ad server, that's indicating that Google's publisher ad server isn't equally interoperating with a rival ad exchange. And um, similarly, uh, the Google ad exchange might, is, doesn't um, direct, interoperate and on equal footing in terms of say providing data, other, other things with, with rival um, DSPs, demand size platforms. And so what that does is it makes it hard for a rival ad exchange um, to enter. Now you might say, well, if, if the these tools are so bad, why doesn't a new tool come in? But here we've got an arrow going in the other direction. Google's ad exchange was the largest ad exchange. And so it doesn't necessarily um, interoperate on equal terms with a rival tool. And that's where you, you can get this type of behavior to, um, to, to be robust to entry by rival tools providers, because if, you, the, if the platform cannot, can, can decide, the big platform can decide not to interoperate with rival tools, then uh, it's very hard for rival tools to enter because what publisher wants an ad server that can't interoperate with the largest platform. And so you have this kind of reinforcing effects across the ad exchange and the publisher ad servers. So this is a current example that's, that's getting litigated and it's gonna probably be lit litigated for a long time. And so it feels like it, again, it could be worthwhile to have specialized models that focus on this kind of behavior. So we, we, so Fiona and I kind of introduced this, this term platform annexation to kind of capture these types of examples. And we say it's a plat practice where a platform takes control of ad adjacent tools, products, or services and operates them in a way that interferes with efficient multi-homing. And it's gonna use that the, to steer users to the integrated platform and away from rivals. And so why is this inefficient? Um, what, what, how do we apply theory specifically to explain why this is inefficient? Well, first of all, there are externalities 
from multi-homing and tools. So the benefits will accrue to all participants if a competing platform is strong enough to reduce the take rate. So going back to an example like this, if we, if we didn't have a, 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 a annexation by, in this case, Google buying double click of the tools, then we might, the, within these tools would serve the interests of publishers and they would help, um, help publishers choose between different ad exchanges. And if there was multi-homing on both sides, ad exchanges would have very low margins and therefore, um, um, you know, the, a lot of the benefits would accrue to publishers who are the people writing the news articles and doing the R&D. So the, the, the publishers are people um, who we should care about because they're also doing R&D. And if we, if we had these tools helping facilitate competition, then take rates would be low and more of the surplus would go to the, the platform participants. Um, but the individual participant bears the cost of multi-homing. And, uh, and, and the tools providers, the entry and investment by the tools providers are also going to create positive externalities for the marketplace participants, whether or not an in individual buys the tools. So the value of the tools to individuals for comparing platforms um, is, 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 is really an externality. And actually, if they succeed and platforms are competitive, also, you know, you may not need the tools as much because you're getting a good deal on both platforms. So there's a lot of positive externalities floating around when it comes to these tools. The tools are really creating the conditions that economists think of as ripe for competition, like price comparison and, and low switching. And the impact of platform annexation is it, deri it, it deprives rival platforms of access to constituents, which harms competition in the short and long run. It also is going to deter entry and reduce competition in both tools and platforms. And it's going to maintain the ability of the platform to extract surplus from the constituents. So the impact is really, if a platform annexes the lo local tools, they're going to change the nature of competition. And this is why the traditional kind of, you know, competitive theories, why we shouldn't worry about integration don't apply because there's externalities and because the annexation affects competition. And the final thing we have to, to, to really think about, which I've, I've already alluded to, but just to kind of summarize, um, you know, why doesn't competition in some part of this take care of this problem? Like, why don't participants switch to better tools if the tools are, are, are hurting them? And when you read through the litany of all the things that these publisher tools did to publishers, it's kind of amazing. You know, you, you were hiring, a, you were buying a tool that was helping a publisher, um, in principle, helping a publisher make money. But those, those tools were actually rigging auctions and, uh, and it, and you know, lowering revenue for publishers. And so the publishers actually fought that very hard um, and, and um, you know, really didn't like these tools, but they, why didn't, so why didn't they switch? Well, in the short run, the participant can switch with, stick with tools because the platform might offer exclusive access to the users of the Annex tool on the other side of the market, and they can degrade interoperability with a competing tool. So if, if either the publishers sponsored their own tool or if an independent tool came in, what they're worried about is that that tool might not interoperate with the largest platform because the biggest platform might refuse to interoperate with them. So you might go to all this effort to create a new tool and get people on it, and then it's not going to be useful because it, it can't access the other side of the market. So there's sort of this chicken and egg problem, um, and that can be the, the, and and they can. You can be blocked from getting the egg if 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 there is unique access on the other side of the market, and that was the case with the search with the with the um, advertising exchanges. And the incremental value to a participant of accessing a smaller platform is low. What's most important to the to, to, to the participants is getting access to the most users on the other side of the market. In the long run, the participant might stick with tools because the smaller platform might deteriorate. And so multi-homing just becomes less important if, if the other platforms are, are weak and don't, and don't provide enough, um, enough users on the other side. So it's a, it can be a little bit like predation where you can, um, you can degrade performance with your tool for the short term, but if you succeed in weakening the, plot, the, the competing platform, then in the long run, uh, you know, there's they, they're basically in in this case inducing exit, say, of, of, of or, or weakening rival ad exchanges. And once there aren't rivals, then there's no point in having another tool that helps you access those rivals. Um, 
And why don't new tools enter? Again, tools, there, there may be switching costs for the users and scale economies, and the large platform has the threat to withdraw or reduce interoperability with new entrant tools. And so it, uh, really this, it's this kind of, if you, if you can get, if you can control both the biggest tool and the biggest platform, um, these, these, these dueling X's here can reinforce each other and prevent um, entry and competition in either tools or the ad exchange. So that's the basic theory that, that we've laid out. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've talked, I've already kind of talked through what the, you know, welfare impacts are. Just to summarize from an antitrust perspective, it's more like horizontal than classic vertical conduct. Um, it creates conflicts of interest rather than resolves them. And in, in it enables a platform to increase take rates. And again, this is a theme that Steve Salop has, in, has, has mentioned uh, as well, that sometimes a vertically related product really helps support competition. Um, it's more likely to be anti-competitive if there's strong and direct network effects and scale economies, and if it's undertaken by the leading firm. Sometimes lagging firms need to build their own tools. So we shouldn't necessarily just blanket prohibit people from building their own tools, but, but they're more likely to be used in an anti-competitive way from a smaller firm and, if there, and there's barrier to entry in tools. And remedies could include preventing merger, requiring divestiture, or requiring interoperability and non-discrimination, or avoiding exclusive or exclusionary practices. So let me stop there. I'm out of time. Um, I, I should also mention, though, I didn't mention platform envelopment by Eyes and Men. I had, a, I had a slide coming to that later, and this also relates to that. So I just didn't want to um, shortchange that reference. Um, so let me stop here, and we can uh, have discussion. Thank you very much, Susan. So let's uh, hear from Steve Salop for a few five minutes. Okay, well, I had actually prepared comments on the paper uh, rather than on the talk. The talk actually answered a lot of questions I had about, about the paper. Um, you know, the paper is more geared towards the, lo the law group rather than the economics group. And, uh, you know, in that regard, I thought it was a really terrific non-technical explanation of the economic foundation of the Texas AG's case. Uh, it's a lot clearer than the complaint. If you read the complaint, you're going to find that this pre the paper's a lot clearer. And so I certainly hope that the Texas AG and the Texas AG's team and their expert read this paper because uh, it'll be a definite complement to, um, to, 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 to their complaint. Um, in terms of the, 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 the economics, um, well, Susan laid it out very clearly. I, I want to make it even, maybe even a little clearer. Uh, we talk, if you start with the single monopoly profit idea, um, there's this question of why doesn't a monopoly exchange simply set high unbundled prices for the platform uh, rather than tying? And the idea is that the tying raises barriers to entry. It prevents multi-homing and forces entrance in the, in the simple vertical model to attempt two level entry. Um, now in the case of Google, as you saw uh, from Susan's presentation, it's not preventing two level entry, it's really three level entry that an entrant would need a rival platform and then tools on, on both sides. Or in fact, it's really maybe five level entry once you add uh, ad servers for search advertisers uh, and you separate out small advertisers and, and large advertisers. So it's certainly harder to enter at five levels uh, than it is to enter at one at, at just at one level. And you know, even aside from the fact of that there's switching costs, network effects, scale economies, and uncertainty. Um, I'll tell you a story. I mean, uh, my own story is I, I once asked John Malone, who was a tech billionaire, he owned the largest cable network in America, TCI, and he's now Liberty Global uh, in Europe and Latin America. And I, I, he had written a paper in the original Bell Journal of Economics. So I felt I could ask him an economics question. And I said, well, you know, there's this single monopoly profit theory. Why don't you just raise the price on uh, for TCI rather than vertically integrate into content, which he had done. Uh, he owned a lot, of, a lot of content, still does. And his answer was, well, if you just raise your price of the, of the product of which you've got a lot of market power, that just puts a target on your back. It's going to attract a lot of entry from people that see those high, those high prices. It's better to expand your real estate. That raises barriers to entry. And that's what this paper is all about, is what Google 
does is it keeps expanding the real estate. And that's what the other tech platforms uh, do as well in order to raise barriers to entry. Um, regarding, um, regarding the paper, well, I, let me make one other, one other remark about the economics. What Susan calls raising rivals cost, I call in my own uh, terminology, input foreclosure. And what she's calling vertical manipulation, I call customer foreclosure which is Rasmussen and, uh, and uh, Siegel and Winston, but here in a, in a dynamic context, rather in the static context in which they had it. Um, the, um, re regarding the, you know, the, the, the paper itself, um, I would have liked to have seen in the paper uh, if you had gone back to Microsoft because the original tool, the original manipulation of the tools was Microsoft's uh, killing Java and Netscape, which were tools to create multi-homing. I thought that would help a lot in the paper. Um, the only thing I really didn't like about the paper is something that Susan alluded to at the end, which is this pandering of saying, this isn't vertical, it's horizontal. Uh, now, the, the authors are, are, are quite explicit about that. They just don't want to confuse or offend anyone that thinks that vertical's good and horizontal's bad. So if it's bad, we're going to call it horizontal. If it's good, we're going to call it vertical. Um, while I appreciate the goal, I'd prefer that we educate our audience and teach them. My formulation uh, is to say, well, the conduct is vertical, the anti-competitive effects are horizontal. And that, that seems like a pretty straightforward uh, way to say it. And it connects to this idea that Susan alluded to in my new paper with Serge Moresi to show how the indirect competition um, is eliminated but when, when there's input foreclosure. We actually show in this new paper, which is on SSRN, that input you can treat input foreclosure as, as increasing what we call an effective HHI in the downstream market. It's a, we create a modified HHI that captures the effect of uh, uh, of the uh, of the foreclosure. So one other comment, I've got one other comment uh, on potential research. Uh, you know, a monopoly platform that uh, is compensated on the basis of a fraction of the buyers of the buyer's price, or based on the number of you of successful matches, that monopolist does not. Uh, in order, to ma in order to maximize its revenue, it does not want to maximize its take rate per transaction. Rather, it might want to maximize the number of transactions. So let me give you an example, simple example. Suppose you've got three buyers, uh, advertisers, if you will, with willingnesses to pay of $5, $4, and $3. And suppose you've got three sellers, uh, publishers, if you will, that have, um, Willingness is to offer of two dollars, three dollars, and four dollars. So five, four, three on the demand curve, two, three, four uh, on the supply curve. I should have mirrored. I'm sorry. Um, and so you know the the optimal number, the efficient number of matches is two, uh, and the gross surplus would be four if you if you actually do do the arithmetic. That is, you can imagine the way the matching would take place. The, you'd you'd match buyer number five with seller number two and buyer number four with seller number three, but then buyer number three could not be matched with seller number four. So the, the, the efficient numbers two. But if the platform is paid per successful match, if you want to think about it that way, they want to match set buyer number or buyer number five with seller number four buyer number four, four with seller number three, buyer number three with seller number two. They could, the, the monopoly platform could create three matches. It would then get paid for three matches and certainly on its percentage, it, it could make more money that way. But yet now there are too many matches. We have outputs exceeds the competitive level and, uh, and surplus falls. Okay, so, what this means, I think, in terms of antitrust, uh, in terms of economics, you can work out the, the maximum number of, uh, of uh, transactions, of successful transactions, depending on the distribution of buyers and, and sellers. As a, as a matter of antitrust, 
we should not be using total output as a measure of welfare, because in this case, you get more than the competitive level of output. And this actually came up in the, in the US, the sort of abysmal American Express case in which the, uh, the court said, well, out output of credit cards went up, not down, uh, and therefore it must be pro-competitive. But in fact, it ignored the fact that the, the way in which the structure with the no steering and created a prisoner's dilemma, and that leads to uh, a greater than competitive level of uh, credit card transactions. So that's, those are my comments.